Well, God bless you. What a joy it is to be able to worship alongside you and know that we're going to be getting to the God's Word together. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and thank you for your prayers. I want you all to know that each of you and your families are in our daily prayers. And if there is something specific that we can help you pray for, please let us know. I'd love to hear from you. My email address is very easy, pastornoel420 at gmail.com. That's pastornoel420 at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. We're going to continue our series titled, How to Enjoy the Rest of Your Life. Doesn't that sound like a, like a, a great title, especially these days? Not a lot of people find enough joy in everything that's gone on over the last couple of years. But believe it or not, the joy that God offers us is irrespective of life's circumstances. In fact, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Today's message is, is rejoicing regardless of your circumstances. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Thank you for the promises that we read in your word. And thank you for the joy that you offer us. Help us to learn today how to rejoice in spite of our circumstances. And may you use this message, not just to teach and edify, but to bless those who are watching. And as we apply these truths in our lives, that you would bless those around us as well. I pray for those who are watching now that have needs, those who may be hurting, that you bless them and that you strengthen them. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a man who was diagnosed with terminal cancer. When he heard the news, one of the first things he did walking out of the doctor's office is he went to buy and customize his own headstone. And the inscription he selected on his own headstone was this, forgive me for not having more joy. What a sad inscription. But this man realized, faced with his own mortality, that there's more to life than just existing. And that's what we're talking about this series. Life is more than just existing Life is more than just wandering and just getting by or getting through. Those of us who have put our faith and trust in God have an abundant life. We have the joy of Christ. This man's greatest regret was not enjoying life. He realized that he missed something very important. Because when we're faced with the reality of our own mortality, it forces all of us to reevaluate and shift priorities in our lives. But friends, you don't have to wait until the end of your life or to be faced with the reality of your own mortality to decide that you want to experience the deep, unshakable joy that you want. You can have it right now. Someone once said that when you get to the end of your life, your biggest regrets will not be the things that you did, but the things that you did not do. So if you don't live with joy now, that may be one of the biggest regrets of your life. Do you have that deep joy in your life? Or perhaps you're like me. We've given this deep joy on some occasions and some days and some people let their junk destroy our joy. Can you relate to that? Uh, you don't have to. It's your choice. But unless you intentionally work at cultivating joy in your life, there's a high probability that the problems, the pressures, the people, and the pain in your life will kick the living joy right out of you. Now, most people don't enjoy life. They simply endure it. But it doesn't have to be that way for you. And that's why we're in a series titled, How to Enjoy the Rest of Your Life. And today we're going to be looking at a very important question. Is it really possible to live with joy in your heart, no matter what is happening in your life. A lot of people think this is not possible. That everything needs to line up perfectly in their life in order for them to experience true joy. But true joy doesn't require things to be perfect in your life. 
Having joy doesn't require perfection any more than being loved doesn't require perfection. Do you love people who are imperfect? Do others love you in spite of your imperfections? God does. In fact, Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you can love and be loved without perfection, you can have true joy without perfection. This brings us to the distinction between two words that are so similar that some people use interchangeably. Happiness and joy. Happiness is a feeling based on circumstances. If your favorite sports team wins the game, you are happy. If you get a promotion at work, you feel happy. If you get an A on that exam that you studied so hard for, you get happy. If you get an extra chicken McNugget in your order, you get happy. If you go to the doctor and the results of your tests are negative, you feel happy. Happiness is a feeling based on circumstances. Joy, on the other hand, exists in spite of your circumstances. Joy is an attitude based on confidence. It's an attitude not based on circumstances, but based on confidence. It's a disposition of the soul. It's a posture of the heart. Happiness is external, but joy is internal. You know, Paul uh, Salehammer defines joy this way. Joy is a deep, settled confidence that God is in control of every area of your life. Let me say this again. Joy is a deep, settled confidence that God is in control of every area of your life. And I would add, no matter the circumstances. Now, that was Paul Sailhammer who wrote that. But before Paul Sailhammer wrote that, Paul the Apostle wrote the book of Philippians. And one of his many letters written to different churches recorded in the Bible. And of all his letters, Philippians is perhaps the most personal and practical. And what makes this book so compelling is that it was written from a prison cell. Paul wrote it while he was in prison in one of the least joyful places on earth. Yet he encourages the, the believers in Philippi to experience the fullness of God's joy. Remember that Paul spent two years as a prisoner in Caesarea. He was there as a result of trumped up charges against him for preaching the gospel and doing God's work. As a Roman citizen, Paul had some privileges. He had the, the right to appeal his charges before the emperor. And so he did. He was put on a ship to Rome to appear before Nero. But while on the ship, the Bible tells us that they were shipwrecked. And so Paul arrived to an an island called Malta, and there he was bitten by a poisonous snake. After many months, Paul spends another two years in prison in Rome awaiting his trial. That's not a life of roses. That was a series of adverse situations, adverse situations circumstances. Yet in spite of his adversity, in spite of all his problems, all his headaches, all his pain, Paul said this in Philippians 1 verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I in this, I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. In other words, Paul is saying that he is rejoicing as a prisoner. And he was rejoicing as he got falsely accused. He was rejoicing as he was shipwrecked. He was even rejoicing as he was bitten by the snake. And no one and nothing was standing in the way of his joy. Now friends, begs the question, what does Paul know about joy that we don't? What's his secret? As we read the book of Philippians, we will discover four ingredients that are essential to have joy in our lives. The first one is this. If you want to rejoice, regardless of your circumstances, you have to live with the right perspective. You have to live with the right 
perspective. In Philippians 1 verses 12 and 13, Paul says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Now, what we discover in these verses is that Paul chose to see things from God's point of view. It was Paul's dream to go to Rome to preach the gospel. You see, Rome was the epicenter of the world. It was like the New York City of the U.S., but on a global scale. And who could argue with that dream? But Paul's dream was not God's plan, at least not exactly. Through a series of events triggered by his arrest, Paul ends up in Rome, but not as a free man. Able to preach in the stadium or in a prominent landmark, Paul's perspective helped him to realize that even as a prisoner, he was still able to preach and to witness to others in Rome. You see, as a prisoner, he was surrounded by guards who were chained to him, literally chained to him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And these were no ordinary guards. These were the royal guards, each being groomed to be future leaders of Rome. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there a more strategic group of people that Paul could witness to, to impact the entire Roman Empire? It makes you wonder, who was a real prisoner? Was it Paul or those guards? And over a two-year period, it is estimated that Paul had the opportunity to share the gospel message with over 4,000 royal guards. These were men who had an inside track to the emperor. And as a result, history tells us that even some of Nero's family members came to believe in Jesus. You see, friends, this was all part of God's plan. And Paul recognized that. Why? Because he saw things from God's point of view. He had God's perspective in mind. And so Paul saw his suffering from God's perspective. He realized that God had a plan that was bigger, a plan that was better than his own. There's a story that helps to illustrate this. In 1921, a missionary couple from Sweden named David and Svea Flood left for Africa with their two-year-old child. In Africa, in a place called the Belgian Congo, they met another missionary couple, and they decided to take the gospel to a remote village that had never heard of Jesus. But when they arrived, they found out that the chief of the village would not let them live among his people. They had to live uh, about a mile away. And the only contact they had was with a young boy that the chief would allow them to come to them to sell them food. Now, over time, Svia witnessed to this young boy, and she brought him to Jesus. Meanwhile, the other couple contracted malaria, and they decided to go back. Svia soon became pregnant, and she also contracted malaria. And unfortunately, she died days after giving birth to their daughter, Abby. Story goes that David, Svia's husband, buried her there, And he blamed God for her death. He said, I've given up so much. And look at how God has repaid me. And so he went back to Sweden with his son. And he left his newborn daughter with another missionary couple. He said, all my joy in my life is gone. And it seems the pain of his loss was more than he could bear. From his perspective, this is how the story ended. Fast forward, in the 1980s, there was a series of books called Choose Your Own Adventure. You could choose your own ending. I remember reading those books. They were among my favorite because you could read up to a certain point and it would give you different options for different endings. If you wanted this ending, go to page 72. If you want that ending, go to page 85. If you want this other ending, page, go to page 100. But When you read through these books, you realize all of us reach a point in our lives where we could all choose the ending in the story of our life when life gets too overwhelming, when the relationships get broken, when the pain level gets too intense. And so you see, going back to David Flood, 
the missionary, he had reached the point in his life. He had little joy left in his life. He thought that the story ended there with his wife's death. Now, I want you to think about this question. What if what feels like the end of the story is actually just the middle? That there's more to come. And in order to have this mindset, you have to look at things from God's perspective. For Paul, prison was not the end. It was the middle of the story. For Paul, the shipwreck was the middle of the story. Getting bitten by a snake was the middle of the story. In the same way, whatever you're, you're going through right now, my friend, it's not the end. It's likely the middle of your story. What if pain, the pressures, the problems, the people are not the end? What if, what if you're in a moment where God is using that adversity in a significant way to accomplish his purpose and plan for your life? Let me offer you a word of advice. Don't let the wrong perspective cloud up God's ultimate plan for your life. God is always at work and he is always moving his plans forward. Don't let the wrong perspective cloud up God's ultimate plan for your life. You know, one of the most famous scriptures in all the Bible that confirms this is found in Romans 8.28. Listen to what this says. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't say in some things or in half the things. It says all things. It doesn't say we think or we hope. It says we know. That's confidence. That's not a probability, my friends. It's a promise. It's a promise from God. So when you're hurting, when the pain is too much to bear, when you're the one who gets sick, you're the one whose job gets eliminated, you're the one who loses a loved one, consider God's promise that he's not finished. He's not finished with you yet. He is not done. That is not the end of your story. Going back to the missionary couple, the daughter who was born, Abby, that newborn of that missionary family from Sweden who was left in Africa after her mother had died and her father had gone back to Sweden, brokenhearted and bitter. Abby was adopted by another missionary couple. She was raised in the United States. And one day, Abby, who was a few years older, was flipping through a Swedish magazine and she came across a picture of a grave with a white cross on it, and she recognized the name on the grave. It was a name of her mother, Svia Flood. And so she quickly found someone to translate that story in that magazine into English. She was anxious. She was, she was dying to know what it said about her mother. Sometime later, Abby traveled to Sweden to meet her father. And by this time, he'd been married, he'd had other children, uh, but he also became bitter and unfortunately had become an alcoholic. He was around 70 years old and he was very ill. And the moment that he saw his daughter, he burst into tears and he wept uncontrollably. But he still blamed God for what had happened to his wife so many years before. He would go around and tell people that his life was ruined by God. Abby said to him, Dad, I have a story to tell you. That little boy that my mother led to Christ grew up to lead his entire village to Christ. Today, she said, more than 600 people serve God because you listened to the voice of God and you served him faithfully. David was stunned to hear the story. You see, he had no idea that this had happened. He had no idea that the story had not ended with his wife's death. And by the end of that day, his perspective completely changed. And his new perspective opened the door for joy to once again fill his heart. 
I can't help but wonder how different David's life might have been if he only realized that what he thought was the end of his story was actually the middle. Paul says this in Philippians 1.14, And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You see, when we have the right perspective about our problems and we see things from God's point of view, we can make statements like this. Hopeful statements about what God is doing and how God is working. Friends, Paul found joy in knowing that his suffering, his chains, everything that he had endured, they had helped others become more courageous and fearless in their faith. So this brings us to the first lesson we can learn from the book of Philippians. Here it is. God has a purpose behind every one of your problems. God has a purpose behind every one of your problems. You may not see it just yet, but God does. So don't let the wrong perspective rob you of the joy that God intends for you. Don't let the wrong perspective rob you of that joy. The story of the floods of this missionary couple to Sweden is an impactful one that reminds us all that we may never know the full extent of what God is doing in us and through us. Where God places us, where He puts us, where He leads us, the impact He makes through us. We plant seeds. Sometimes we see them blossom. Sometimes we don't. But it's so important, friends, that we recognize that sometimes what we think is the end of the story, from God's eyes, it is not. And that's why it is so important that we learn from Paul. Paul saw his chains not as a source for pain. He saw them as a vehicle that God used To expand his kingdom. And this is why Paul, even as a prisoner, awaiting his fate, was able to encourage the Christians in Philippi to embrace the joy. To embrace that joy. To rejoice in spite of his circumstances. Friends, we're going to continue our message on rejoicing no matter your circumstances, next time. But I leave you with today's lesson. The first ingredient we need to rejoice in spite of our circumstances, and that is to live with the right perspective. And the lesson we learn from this is that God has a purpose behind every one of your problems. Don't give up. Don't despair. Keep on believing. Keep on trusting. Keep on serving because God has a purpose. Your story is not over yet. God has much more to do with you and through you. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we could spend in your word. Thank you for teaching us today that we can rejoice in spite of our circumstances if we live with the right perspective. Because when we see things from your point of view, it gives meaning and it gives purpose to all that we go through, including the pain and the hardship and the adversity. We learn from Paul how he saw his chains. From your point of view, from your perspective, those chains were a necessary vehicle to get your gospel message out to more people. What a powerful lesson for all of us today. Whatever it is that we are enduring, we're facing, we're going through, remind us that you have a purpose behind every problem. And so I pray for those who are watching today who are suffering, who are going through adversity, who are facing a setback perhaps, that you would encourage them, that you would shift their perspective 
that they would recognize that if they see things from your point of view, it would give meaning to what they're going through. And it would encourage them to keep serving you and embrace the joy that you and only you give us in spite of our circumstances. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining us again today. We're going to continue our message on rejoicing in spite of your circumstances next time. In the meantime, don't forget, don't forget, live with the right perspective. If you want to rejoice in spite of life's circumstances, live with the right perspective. And remember, God has a purpose behind every problem you face. God bless you.